Well, without further ado, we'd like to introduce you to our very special featured speaker today. Act has been telling deliciously imaginative folk tales, often from Sweden and Norway since 2001. Rose is the author of the children's book, The Sock Goblin, and the YA novel, The Marvelous Imagination of Katie Adams. And she has performed around the US as well as in India and Sweden. Rose lives in Grand Marais, Minnesota, and is also a member of Svea, an acapella Swedish folk quartet that blends poetry and song. It's my pleasure to toss it now to you, Rose. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, yeah, I, I imagine if you're from anywhere further south than I am, it maybe still looks more like fall. And right now I don't have any snowflakes coming down, but we have had a few today. And all the trees are bare, so I can see Lake Superior from my house at the moment. Um, which feels very lovely and northern and Nordic. So I grew up um, very connected with my, especially my Swedish heritage. I have both Swedish and Norwegian and went to Scandinavian festivals as a kid. And then when I got into storytelling, I um, naturally put the two of them together. So uh, many of my favorite stories are from Sweden and Norway and Thanks especially to Asbjörnsson and Mo. <laughs> Most of them are probably attributed to Norway, but I like to think that, you know, Swedes and Norwegians, we're good neighbors. We probably can share them back and forth. This first one that I'll start with um, is one that I love because I grew up eating plattar, the really skinny pancakes. And I didn't eat them the way you're supposed to with whipped cream and either strawberry or lingonberry jam because my family across the road from where I grew up makes maple syrup. But we would have them every Saturday night while we listened to Garrison Keillor tell stories of Lake Wobegon. But you have to travel quite far from Minnesota to find the little cottage where this story began and travel back and back and back in time to the day when the leaves were just beginning to bud on the trees, when the wind was not even a wind yet, but just a gentle breeze bringing the first hint of spring down from the mountain and perhaps a bit of magic. And if you were in just the right place at just the right time, you would hear the sound of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven very hungry children and one very tired mother. The children looked to their mother and they said, Mama, 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 we're hungry. And there's nothing to eat in the house. Now, whether this was true or not, I'm sure that you have all experienced it. And if you're watching with someone, go ahead and look at them or perhaps look right into your camera and show me your most desperate and sad face this should be very easy for all of you Scandinavians to participate because I can't even see you right now. It's like a dream come true. And put your hands together and put on your saddest face and say, Mama, 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 we're hungry. And no matter what the poor mother offered, the children simply said, no, no, no. Do you want meatballs, my darlings? No, 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 said the children. Do you want Pickled herring or pickled beets? No, no, no. They didn't even want lefsa, if you can believe it. And at last, the poor exasperated mother threw up her hands and said, well then, what if I make you the biggest pancake in the world? Ooh, that was exactly what those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children wanted. And so, that poor mother got out the biggest bowl she could find. She cracked a dozen eggs. She poured in a bucket of milk. She melted so much butter, I won't even tell you how much. And a whole sack full of flour, a bit of sugar, a bit of salt. And she whisked and whisked while the children's eyes went around and around and around. And then she heaved a griddle down from the wall that was as large as a wagon wheel and set it on the stove. When it was hot and golden with melted butter, she poured that batter to the very edge of the skillet. And then came the truly hard part. 
for those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children. They had to wait. They stood just as close as they could, breathing in the smell of that delicious pancake. And about every two and a half seconds, they looked up at their poor mother and said, is it done yet? No, be patient. And they were as patient as they could be, but it was a fine spring day and there was a mischievous breeze coming down from the mountain and they were about to eat the world's biggest pancake. So can you blame them? Is it done now? No, said their mother. Is it done now? No, just wait until it flips itself. It must be cooked on both sides. Maybe it was that particular mountain wind. Maybe it had been sent down by a sprite or a troll, or maybe it was simply the words that that tired mother used. But words matter. And as soon as she said, wait until it flips itself, the pancake awoke. And it looked down at the very edge of the skillet at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children all staring greedily at it. And it began to plot its escape. As soon as those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children turned away and set the table with the plates and the cups and the forks and the knives, the pancake leapt to its edge, but it was only half baked and it flopped itself over. And then it's time came. The children sat down with fork and knife in each hand. We want a pancake, we want a pancake, we want a pancake. The mother rolled up her sleeves and she prepared to heave that griddle onto the table and the pancake took its chance. It leapt off onto its edge and this time it had the strength to leap from the skillet onto the table, it wove in between the plates and the cups and the forks and the knives past the children whose mouths hung wide open, almost as big as the pancake itself, off the table and out through the open door and down the street. The children ran after it. They ran and they ran and this is what they shouted. Pancake, pancake. So repeat after me. Pancake, pancake. Thin and sweet. Let us have a bite to eat. But the pancake only rolled faster down that dusty dirt road and peered over its skinny little shoulders and said, Oh, no, 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 I don't think so. I'm very sorry, but away I go. And away went the pancake, not caring for one moment that its edges were getting torn and ragged and covered in dust. Soon, the road began to slope downhill, the pancake went faster and faster, and the pitter-patter of the children's feet were left behind in the dust. And as soon as it was safe, as soon as the pancake couldn't hear a thing, the pancake steered itself into a grassy meadow and flopped down to rest and to wait for the world to stop spinning. At last, it was safe. Or was it? It wouldn't make for much of a story if that was that. And in fact, that wasn't that. The pancake, as it looked up at the blue sky and the fluffy white clouds, began to notice another oddly fluffy shape that blinked at it and looked back down, a shape that made a sound. <laughs> it was a sheep. And that sheep was licking its lips. Who knew that even sheep liked delicious pancakes. The pancake didn't wait to find out. The pancake leapt up onto its edge and began once again to roll down the hill. But the sheep trotted behind it. And the sheep said in its best sheepy voice, and you can say it with me this time, pancake, pancake, thin and sweet. Let me have a bite to eat. But the pancake rolled faster and faster down the hill, getting covered in grass stains on every inch of its edge. And the pancake simply said, oh no, 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 I don't think so. I'm very sorry, but away I go. And away went the pancake, faster and faster. For if you have ever seen a picture of the hills of Norway or been there yourself, you can imagine that it was a long and fast trip down. And just as the pancake was beginning to wonder how it was going to stop, there was something large and red and, oh, very solid. 
A pancake had run itself right into the side of a bright red barn in a quiet, peaceful barnyard. At last, at last, there were no children, there was no hungry sheep, the pancake was safe. And then from around the corner of the hen house came a flapping and a clucking. <laughs> And I know that chickens don't have lips, but that pancake could have sworn that the chicken licked its lips and flapped her wings. And then out came the rest of the chickens. So take your wings out, everyone. Let me hear your best chicken noise. <laughs> the pancake <gasps> began to roll through the barnyard and the chickens were fast behind. And they said, pancake, pancake, thin and sweet. Let us have a bite to eat. But the pancake rolled and rolled and rolled, paying no heed to mud puddles or ditches or barbed wire fences. Oh, no, 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 I don't think so. I'm very sorry, but away I go. And if you can believe it, every single time the pancake stopped to try to catch its breath, something wanted to gobble it up. It is difficult to be a delicious pancake out in the world. The pancake rolled and rolled and rolled through towns and cities, over fields, through swamps, even, even quite likely a cow pie, until it came at last to the edge of a great forest. The pancake hardly looked from left to right. The pancake was too tired. If it was going to be eaten, then so be it. It was just about to flop down in the shade of a great tree, when out of the mud puddle, there rose a monster or something covered in mud. And that something squelched closer and closer to the pancake who simply couldn't roll another inch more and stood there trembling and quivering, ready to meet its destiny. And that muddy something that pig sniffed up and down the pancake. It smelled mud and dust and dirt and cow pie and swamp sludge. And the only thing that the pig knew of that smelled like that were pigs. Oh, hello there, little pig. Oh, I'm so glad to have some company. I have been waiting and waiting because I am too afraid to go into the deep, dark forest by myself. Shall you and I, two pigs, go together? Yes, said the pancake. Oh. The pancake squelched along next to the pig, and they talked of this and that, and that pig never suspected that it was walking next to a delicious pancake. Pigs had it easy. Nobody wanted to eat pigs. Everything was just fine until, well, until they came to the stream, until they came to the creek, until they came to maybe what the pancake would have called a rushing river. The pig, buoyant as it was, trotted into the water, but the pancake put in one edge. Oh, oh, it's cold and I can't swim. Help! Oh, little friend, said the pig. I, I could carry you across on my snout and you won't even get a splash. What a wonderful idea. So the pancake laid itself on the pig's snout and in they went into the water. And at first, everything was fine, for the water was just a gentle ripple. But as it got deeper, there were a few drops here and there that splashed up onto the pancake and carried away some of that dust and some of that dirt. Do you, do you smell something? Uh, no, I don't smell anything, said the pancake. Keep swimming. And so the pig went a little deeper and a little deeper, but the waves grew splashier and larger, and a little more of the dust and the dirt and the sludge and the slime was washed off the pancake. No, I, I smell, I smell a smell that I know, a delicious smell. You don't smell anything. Go, 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 said the pancake. 
But when they got to the very middle of the stream, to the part where it was deepest and splashiest, when the waves could really be called waves, one of them, one of them splashed up at just the right moment, and it lifted the pancake off of the pig's nose. Help! cried the pancake, and the pig, who I know, I believe, was only trying to save its friend, well, grabbed on the only way a pig could. <sniffs> With its mouth. Oh. Oh my. Oh no. I'm sorry, but you taste delicious. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you that that was the end of the delicious pancake. But in case you're thinking that this is a tragic tale, what are pancakes made for but to be eaten? And what are pigs best at doing but eating? And so perhaps, perhaps we can say that this is a story in which a delicious pancake fulfilled its destiny. And if not that, at least the pig crossed to the other side of the river and lived happily ever after. Thank you very much, especially if you um, snorted like a pig or clucked like a chicken or ran like a child. Give yourselves a round of applause. Um, I wonder if that story is familiar to anyone. I had I found that in a, a collection and as soon as I started reading it, it reminded me of another story that of course is better known even if you're not a Swede or a Norwegian. This is the part, I suppose, where if I was in person with you, I would hear you saying, the gingerbread man! So I'm just gonna know that you're a very smart audience and I bet you can tell. Um, yes, uh, let's see, how can I see any of you? I didn't even change my view here. Maybe I can. No, I don't see you. Yes. Um, I see. Feel free to shout out your answers in the chat. Lovely. I'd also love to know if anybody else grew up having um, Swedish pancakes or something like that for dinner because it was always Saturday night um, and it was never for breakfast. It was always for dinner. So I actually felt that puffy pancakes, which my grandma would make, were the most elegant, special, exotic food <laughs> because I had Swedish pancakes once a week. Mm. I'll tell you another story that I'm sure you've heard and um, I don't know if many people think of it as, um, as a Norwegian story. And, hmm, even though I can't see you, I will imagine you with my great imagination. And so go ahead and raise your hands or put a hand up in the chat and let me know if you have brothers or sisters. I myself have three sisters. And, um, ooh, sourdough pancakes. This is maybe why it's difficult for me to ask questions in the chat because... Oh, we couldn't talk because Garrison Keillor was on. Yes, I love that. Um, my, I would, my sister Josie, who's younger, the closest in age to me, would pour and I would flip. And Abby was too young to help with the pancakes at all other than eating them. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, so if you have brothers or sisters, or even if you have cousins or you simply grew up with kids around. Think about if you have an oldest, a middle, and a youngest, or a whole range. Is the middle child ever the one who is in charge, or even the youngest child? No. It's always the oldest. And as the oldest child in my family, that seems perfectly natural, perfectly normal, the way that the most fun will happen. But I have noticed, both from this story and from real life, that it seems that the younger siblings sometimes would like to have a little more independence and autonomy. And it was just this way for these three brothers, who were just like you or I in many ways, but very different in a few. And that was that they had furry ears and skinny little tails and four hooves and two horns each because they were the three Billy Goats gruff. 
Now this story is one that, um, that even though I can't see you, I would love for you to participate with. We have a lot of sounds and movements. And to begin with, to begin with all three billy goats gruff, we're fast asleep on a bright green hillside. So you can hold your little hooves together and rest your furry little cheeks on them. And give me some gentle billy goat snores. Just as the sun came up over the hillside and the birds awoke and the bees awoke, there was a of a curious little fly that landed on the littlest Billy Goat Gruff's ear and, and he awoke as well. He yawned and he stretched and he looked to his right and there, to his amazement, were his two brothers still fast asleep. And all of a sudden, the littlest Billy Goat Gruff knew that today was the day. The day when he could have an adventure without any older brothers bossing him around or telling him what to do. And so he tiptoed away. And then he began to run up the hills and down the valleys. And as he ran, his little hooves, go ahead and make some little hooves like this, went trip bitty trip, trip bitty trip, trip bitty trip, trip trip. Go ahead and try that with me. Trip bitty trip, trip bitty trip, Trip, bitty, trip, trip, trip. He ran up the hills and down the valleys. He ran across the fields and through the tall, dark forests until he came to a rushing river that sounded like this. <laughs> Go ahead and do that too. <laughs> he stopped and he stared, for on the other side of the river was the greenest grass the littlest Billy Goat Gruff had ever seen in his young life. Now, lucky for him, there was a little wooden bridge that led to the other side. And so, without another thought, he began to cross the bridge. Trip, bitty, trip, trip, bitty, trip, trip, bitty, trip, trip, trip. And when he got to the center of the bridge, he heard a boom and a boom. The sky grew dark above him. The water in the river started to bubble and boil. <laughs> until up out of the water popped the head of a terrible troll. I'm going to assume that you all gasped in terror here because you are good Scandinavians and you understand how terrifying a truly terrible troll is. But in case you can't picture it, in case you cannot relate to the littlest Billy Goat Gruff's dread, allow me to describe this troll to you. This troll, this troll had eyes as big as plates. This troll had ears like doorknobs. This troll had a nose like a long lumpy carrot and teeth like moldy cheese. This troll looked up at the littlest Billy Go Gruff and said in his best troll voice, Who's that tramping over my bridge? Oh, it's only me. I mean, I, I mean, the littlest Billy Goat Gruff. I, I was just going to the other side to eat the green grass and get nice and fat. Who are you? I'm the troll, said the troll, and I'm feeling hungry. And I think I'm going to gobble you up, gobble you up, gobble you up. Oh, oh no, no, no. You don't want to, you don't want to eat me. I, I, I'm just skin and bones. I'm hardly even a mouthful. Not even a mid-morning snack. Why, you know what you should do. You know what you should do, said the littlest Billy Goat Gruff, just like I suspect many younger brothers or sisters might say, you know what you should do instead? You should wait because my brother, the middle Billy Goat Gruff, who is much bigger than me, will be coming along to look for me in no time and you should eat him instead. Hmm. That troll was not very bright, but even the troll could see that, yes, indeed, that littlest Billy Goat Gruff was on the scrawny side. And even that troll could imagine that if the littlest Billy Goat Gruff crossed to the other side and ate the green grass and got nice and fat, he would be a much 
better tastier meal the next time it crossed the bridge. And so the troll blub, 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 sank back down under the water to wait for the middle billy goat gruff. Back on that first hillside, the two older brothers were still fast asleep with their cheeks on their little hooves. <laughs> woke up. Mm. He looked to his right and there, as always, was his older brother, the biggest billy goat gruff, and he looked to his left and his little brother was gone. And he knew the way the middle ones somehow always do know that his brother had gone off to have an adventure without him. Hmm. Well, two could play at that game and so he tiptoed away from the sleeping billy goat and then he too began to run up the hills and down the valleys but he was a bit bigger and his hooves were a bit sturdier and when he ran it sounded like this trap bitty trap trap bitty trap trap bitty trap 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 he ran up the hills and down the valleys across the fields through the tall dark forests until he as well came to that big rushing river do you remember how that sounds <gasps> there on the other side he saw his little brother <sniffs> eating the green grass the middle billy goat gruff didn't hesitate for a moment but he ran across the bridge trap bitty trap trap bitty trap trap bitty trap 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 boom the bridge shook boom the sky grew dark and the water began to bubble and boil. <laughs> Up popped the head of the terrible troll. Now let's see if you were listening. The terrible troll, whose eyes were as big as plates, whose ears were like doorknobs, whose nose was like a long, lumpy carrot, and whose teeth, when he smiled, if you could call it a smile, were like moldy cheese. The terrible troll looked up on the bridge and said, who's that tramping over my bridge? And the middle billy goat gruff, oh, he shivered so that his horns knocked together and his hooves clacked together. <laughs> it's only me, I mean I, I mean the middle billy goat gruff. I was just going to the other side to eat the green grass and get nice and fat. Who, who are you? I'm the troll, said the troll, and I'm feeling hungry. Go ahead, take out those troll fingers, give a hungry look at the person next to you, and let them know that you think you're going to gobble you up, gobble you up, gobble you up. Oh, oh no, 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 you don't want to do that. You don't want to eat me. Why, I, I, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even fill two slices of bread for a sandwich. You should you should wait for my brother, the biggest billy goat gruff. He's twice as big as me, four times as big. He'll be coming along to look for me any minute now. You should eat him instead. The troll was pretty sure that he had heard this one before. But nonetheless, he considered. He was hungrier than last time. And so even though the middle billy goat gruff was bigger than the first one, it wouldn't be enough to satisfy the troll. And in the end, he let the billy goat pass and he sank back down to wait. Back on that first hillside, the biggest billy goat gruff was fast asleep and he was snoring such snores that it sounded as if there was an earthquake. It sounded as if a volcano were going to erupt. <laughs> Billy go look to his left and he kept looking for there was nothing where his brother should have been except two flattened circles in the fresh spring grass and he knew the way the oldest always does 
that his brothers had gotten themselves into trouble and that they needed his help. So the biggest billy goat gruff began to run up the hills and down the valleys, but he was so big that the horns on his head stood up like swords and his hooves were like stones. When he ran, the earth trembled and it sounded like this. Trumpity trump, trumpity trump, trumpity trump, trump, trump. He ran up and he ran down. He ran across the fields through the tall dark forests until he came to the rushing river. <laughs> there on the other side were his two brothers. They seemed to be fine, but one could never be sure. And so the biggest billy goat gruff ran across the bridge. Trumpity trump, trumpity trump. Trumpity trump, 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 boom, the bridge shook beneath him, boom, the sky grew dark, and the water began to bubble and boil. <laughs> Up out of the water popped the head of the terrible troll, with eyes as big as plates, ears like doorknobs, a nose like a long lumpy carrot, and teeth like moly cheese. The terrible troll looked up at the biggest belly goat gruff and said, who's that tramping over my bridge? The biggest billy goat gruff, who wasn't scared of anything, not even terrible trolls, said, it's me, the biggest billy goat gruff. I'm going to the other side to join my brothers to eat the green grass and get nice and fat. Who are you? Oh, I'm the troll, said the troll, and I've been waiting for you. I'm feeling hungry. Go ahead, take out those troll fingers. Give that creepy look to the person next to you. And I think I'm going to gobble you up, gobble you up, gobble you up. Oh, you think so, do you? Well, I think if you set one hairy paw on this bridge, I will knock you back into the river where trolls should stay. But the troll wasn't listening. No, the troll was too busy deciding if he should eat the billy goat's ears first or save them for dessert. He climbed paw over paw onto the bridge. Now, on the other hillside, the two younger brothers stopped chewing the green grass and stared down, for there below they saw their brother, the biggest billy goat, Gruff, and the terrible troll, one on each end of the bridge. Their brother lowered his horns and he stomped his hoof and the terrible troll lifted his claws and let out a roar and the two younger brothers had to put their hooves over their eyes. They couldn't watch. All they could hear was a smashing and a crashing. They felt the ground tremble underneath them. They peeked but all they could see was horns and hooves and tails and, and dust and water spraying until finally out of the center of it, out of the middle of the ruckus of the terrible battle, flew the troll. He went high, high up into the air. He did three flying somersaults until he landed with a splash far downstream. And the current carried him away around a bend, never to be seen again. The biggest billy goat gruff. He shook his horns, he stomped his hooves. He crossed to the other side where he and his brothers ate and ate and ate until they grew so thick and fat that they are still there, fat and happy to this very day. Thank you very much and thank you for help with the story. The funny thing is I've, <laughs> thank you. The funny thing is I've never actually asked my younger sisters what they think about uh, that story, which actually seems very fitting for me as the oldest one, <laughs> that I would just assume I can make gener broad generalizations about middle and youngest children, and they don't have any choice. Mm. This isn't really a, a story story, but it does make me think of the things that the poor youngest children have to do. We, um, I grew up on my great grandparents' farmhouse, and so there were lots of old sheds, and we loved to play in the loft of one of them. And Josie and I would climb the ladder to go up, but Abby, the one who, as you may recall, was too young to be allowed to help with the pancakes, was not allowed to use the ladder. She was forced to sit in a metal wash tub 
and we hauled her up with a rope. <laughs> and I don't really know if my mom knows about that or not, <laughs> but Abby's just fine. She turned out just fine. We never dropped her. <laughs> hmm. I'll tell you another story um, with a goat. I did grow up down the road from some neighbors with a couple of goats, uh, and they are quite smart. At least in my experience, these goats knew if the fence was on or off. You couldn't say it out loud. You had to mouth it where they, they couldn't hear you. Um, I don't think they ever fought any trolls, though. And they certainly never did what the goat in this next story did. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Nils who lived with his mother. It was just the two of them on their farm, and it was a hard time that they had. The soil was poor, and Nils was young, and there was never quite enough to eat. Somehow his mother always managed to scrape things together and give him something good to eat. But it had been a long winter and they had gone through all of their stores, so much so that when she opened the cupboards one morning, there wasn't even a dusting of flour to be found. So she sent Nils out to the barn to look in the barrel to see if she could find any, any kernels of wheat that she could grind so they would have flour so they could have bread so that her child could eat. He took a jar out with him and he lifted the lid of the barrel and there were so few grains of wheat that he picked them out one by one. He treated them as if they were gold, as if they were diamonds. He didn't miss a single one. And carefully, very carefully, he walked back out the barn doors. But once again, once again, that same spring wind perhaps, that visited the mother and the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven children. Maybe the wind that rippled the stream before the troll sprang up. That wind, that wind full of all of its spring wildness, rushed down, reached into the jar, and scattered the grains, and was gone. Wait, said Nils, come back. And before he realized what he was doing, he ran after the wind. He ran and he ran and he kept the tail end of the wind in sight. When it went left, he went left. When it went right, he went right up and down and through the trees until oh, he had to stop himself for the wind. The wind had flown right down over the edge of the world itself. And I'm sure you can agree if you've ever been to some of the mountains in Norway, to some of the deep valleys in Sweden, that that is where the end of the world must exist. Well, there was the boy at the edge of the world with nothing in his belly and he hadn't run all of this way to just turn around and go home and so without knowing exactly what else he would say he simply shouted wind but the wind didn't hear him perhaps you can help all together one two three wind shouted the boy there was a great whoosh and up rose the wind out of the darkness, out of the edge of the world, and stared down at the boy. What do you want? I, I only want what's mine. I only want what's fair, said Nils. Speak then, boy. You, you took the last of the wheat, and now we have no grain to make bread. And I just think it would only be fair if you gave it back to me. Ah, said the wind as he rushed this way and that. But the birds, the birds have already eaten the grain. I cannot give you what I have taken, but I will make you a fair trade. You are hungry, you say. And the wind disappeared over the edge of the world. And a moment later, came back with a red and white checkered cloth, which it laid down at the boy's feet. A tablecloth, said Nils. And of course, he was thinking a tablecloth with no food to put upon the table is of very little use. But the wind, who was older than time itself and very wise, understood. 
All you must say, boy, all you must say is, Cloth, give me something good to eat, and it will be filled with your most favorite dishes. Well, that sounded, that sounded not just fair, but more than fair. And so the boy folded up the cloth, thanked the wind, and headed back home. But it was a long way from the edge of the world back to his mother's house, and keep in mind he had not yet had any breakfast, so you can't really blame him for stopping for just a moment for a quick bite to eat. He spread out that cloth, go ahead, spread yours out, and say the magic words with him. Cloth, give me something good to eat. Just like that, it, in less time than it took him to blink. The tablecloth went from being empty to being full from one edge to the other with all of his favorite foods. Oh, there was pickled herring and Swedish meatballs. There was knäckebröd. There was lefse. There were new potatoes in dill. There was fresh butter and cheese. He <coughs> ate until he could not fit another morsel in his belly. Oh. Oh, and as so often happens after a good meal and after a long journey, he grew tired. He brushed the crumbs to one side and he laid down just, just for a moment, just to rest his eyes. And then, then he would go back to his mother's house and show her the cloth. He slept and slept and slept. The sun moved through the sky, and just as the last light was shining across the land, the boy woke up. He shook out the cloth, and he hurried as quickly as he could, but even he could see that he would never make it home before dark came. His mother would worry, but she wouldn't want him to travel at night. And so when he saw lights ahead of him on the road, and when he saw the sign of an inn, he came up with a plan. He had no money, but he had an idea. He slipped in and found a table at the back. He laid the cloth out on the table and he whispered those magic words. Cloth, give me something good to eat. And just like that, the table creaked and groaned under the weight of the feast and people took notice, not to mention the innkeepers, the man and the woman, they came over and my goodness, they couldn't say enough good things about Nils. Every time that the food was nearly finished, he would simply say, cloth, give me something good to eat. And the feasting would begin again. The innkeepers insisted that he was their guest of honor and he must take the finest room they had no charge. In minutes, the boy was asleep with his head sinking into the pillow with the down comforter pulled all the way up to his nose and that magic cloth folded on the bedside table. He slept so deeply, so soundly that he didn't hear the creak, creak, creak on the stairs. He didn't hear He didn't see the flickering light of the lone candle. He didn't see the innkeepers who picked up that magic cloth and left another almost exactly the same in its place. In the morning, they already had breakfast ready and the boy, the boy was beginning to think of the scolding he would get from his mother and there was no need for him to spread the magic cloth out. They wished him well and he ran the rest of the way home sure enough. There was his mother waiting in the barnyard with a look on her face. Mother, mother, he said, before you're angry, I must tell you, I followed the wind to the edge of the world. Oh my, said his mother, my child, my child is so hungry that he's begun to hallucinate. No, no, mother, I went to the edge of the world because the wind took the last of the grain and he made me a fair trade, more than fair, I think. Watch this. He spread the cloth out. His mother looked at the cloth. It's a fine cloth. We could certainly 
fetch a few coins for it at the market. Oh no, mother, watch this. And he said the magic words, cloth, give me something good to eat. Nothing happened. Cloth, give me something good to eat. Oh, my baby is speaking to a cloth, said the woman. Cloth, give me something good to eat. I look like a fool. My dearest boy, said Nils's mother. Oh, my darling child, you did a brave thing. You did a good thing. You stood up for yourself. You asked for what was fair. And that's all that any of us can really do. Life, well, life is simply not always fair in return. But before the words finished leaving her lips, Nils had stomped his foot and turned around and run all the way back to the edge of the world. He could hear the wind whoosh, 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 wind, he cried, and up came the wind. Ah, Nils, did your mother like the cloth? No, she didn't. She thinks, she thinks that I've gone mad. The cloth doesn't do anything anymore. And, and please, I think it would be fair if you would give me another one, for I don't want my mother to think that I'm crazy. Indeed, said the wind, indeed that would be fair. But alas, that is the only cloth of its kind in the world. But perhaps, perhaps I can give you something else, something just as good. The wind whoosh, 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 blew to the top of the hillside, and it flattened and flattened and flattened the tall grasses until it revealed a little white milk goat. I told you there would be a goat. The goat was as white as snow, with eyes the color of gold coins. Oh, thank you, said Nils. With a goat, we will have milk, and we can make cheese and sell it in the market. Ah, said the wind, but this is no ordinary goat. Simply feed this goat a bit of grass, and you shall see what you shall see. Nils picked a bit of grass. Go ahead and take some, and hold it out to the goat. The goat's ears twitched and it sniffed and blinked its eyes. It ate the grass. It blinked again. Its ears twitched again. Its tail lifted up and plink, plink, plink. Down from below the goat's tail fell gold coins. Well, <laughs> Nils didn't think his mother would find that very proper, but he also had a feeling that perhaps, perhaps she could look past that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We'll never be poor again. This is, this is more than fair. And he took a bit of rope out of his pocket and he made a lead for the goat. And he began to walk that little goat home. Oh, just think of what his mother would say. But that little goat was hungry. That little goat stopped and ate the green grass and blinked and lifted her tail and plink, 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 down fell gold coins. Well, I'm sure that you wouldn't leave gold coins just lying there in the road. So Nils filled his pockets. They walked and then once again, the goat ate plink, plink, plink and left another little pile of gold. The boy was so weighted down with gold in every pocket and so exhausted from trying to hurry that little goat along, you can imagine his relief when up ahead he saw the inn, the very same one that he had spent the night in. And you can imagine the way the innkeepers welcomed him back and the way their eyes grew round when he showed them what his little goat could do. Well. They insisted, they insisted on calling neighbors and friends and showing one after the other. And so the day passed with much merriment and food and drink. And then they wouldn't hear of their dear friend, their guest of honor, Nils, going home so late in the evening. No, they would put the little goat in the stable with their very own animals. And Nils, once again, would sleep in the finest room they had. He slept well. He slept so well that he did not see the two shadowy figures crossing the lawn towards the stable in the middle of the night, leading one little white goat in and taking another little white goat out. And if in the morning 
he didn't look that closely, if he didn't notice that his goat's eyes were merely the color of buttercups and not the color of gold coins, well, you can't blame him. He was so excited to show his mother the fair trade he had made with the wind. And every time that little goat tried to stop and eat the grass, he tugged on the rope and she had to follow along. As he expected, his mother clapped her hands with joy. Nils, Nils, I am sorry. I am sorry that I didn't believe you. I'm sorry that I misjudged the wind. But when your life has been as difficult, oh, a goat, a milk goat, we can make cheese, we can sell it. At last, we won't be poor. Mother, said Nils, Mother, look what happens when I feed this goat a little bit of grass. He grabbed a fresh bunch of bright green grass. He held it up to the goat who ate. <laughs> its tail lifted up and plop, 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 plop. I don't suppose that any of you would scoop that up and put it in your pocket, let alone call it treasure. Oh, Nils! Well, I never. Where have you learned such manners out in the world? But before she could say another thing, Nils had dropped the rope and had turned around and was gone once again. And he didn't stop running until he came to the edge of the world. The wind was rushing and Nils shouted, wind! Up came the wind. Yes, Nils, what did your mother think of the goat? Well, she, she thinks that I'm terribly badly behaved and I don't understand why, but it's not making gold coins anymore and I just need you to give me another one, please. It's only fair, isn't it? Tell me everything, said the wind, everything that has happened since you first stepped out of the barn with the grains of wheat. So Nils did every single detail. He didn't leave a thing out. And the wind, who was old and wise, understood. I have one more gift for you, Nils. And I believe this will solve your problems. The wind blew up into the branches of a big dead tree up on the hillside and knocked down a stick just the right size for a walking stick. A stick? A stick. All you must do is say stick lay on or stick lay off. Thank you, said the boy, for he was polite. And after all, he did have a very nice, perfectly ordinary red checkered tablecloth and, and a very sweet little white goat who, even if she didn't make gold coins, would indeed make milk. But he was sad because Maybe his mother was right after all. Perhaps life wasn't fair. So he thanked the wind and he carried the stick with him. And he walked and walked, but he dragged his feet. And when night fell, he had hardly made it even halfway. In fact, he found himself once again, outside of the inn. Nils, said the innkeepers. Oh, our favorite, our friend, you're back with, with a stick, a magic stick. What does this magic stick do? Nothing, said Nils. I, I don't believe in magic anymore. And no matter how they pressed him, they couldn't get another word out of him. They, they tried to get him to, to speak, to, to eat and drink with them, but well, Nils felt he ought to save his money, and so he had a very simple supper. And with one of the coins that was still in his pocket, he paid for not the finest room, but the cheapest room they had. A room so spare and so sparse that it was simply a mattress stuffed with straw on the floor. There was only a single sheet. It was drafty, and it was lumpy. And all he had for company was a stick. He tossed and he turned. And he didn't sleep well. He didn't sleep at all. He thought about the strange things that had happened to him over the last handful of days. And although he wasn't as old or as wise as the wind, when he heard a creak, creak, 
tree on the stair, he began to suspect when he heard and he saw the two faces of the innkeepers flickering in the light of a single candle when he saw that they carried another stick with them. Suddenly he understood what the wind had not, the wind, the wind had given him the stick and what were the words? Stick, lay on, he cried. And that stick leapt up as if it was alive and it began to whack the innkeepers on the shoulders and stomp on their toes and poke them in the bellies until they were doubled over and crying with pain, stop, stop, make it stop, we'll give everything back. Stick lay off, said Nils, and the stick leapt into his hand. He didn't sleep that night, and he left as soon as dawn broke. He left with his stick and his little white goat, whose eyes were the color of gold coins, and his red and white checkered cloth. He walked all the way home to his own farmyard, and when he laid these treasures out before his mother, not only was she proud of her child, so proud, but even his mother had to admit that no, sometimes life was not fair. Sometimes it was far, far better. Thank you. Well, Rose, these were just wonderful. Thank you. It's just delightful to hear these stories. Um, we've seen delightful comments coming in the chats, memories of hearing Three Billy Goats Gruff as a child, people talking about growing up in Norway and eating Norwegian pancakes. Kathleen's brother set their family family record and ate 32 thin pancakes in a single sitting. So <laughs> we've got all kinds of delightfulness happening. One of the questions that has come in though is, how did you get into telling stories? What, what was your gateway into this magical land? Well, I think perhaps a little bit like Nils, I came to um, my good fortune in a very roundabout way. I, <clears throat> I read lots of books as a kid, as I mentioned, grew up listening to Prairie Home Companion. Um, and, and then I just loved doing theater. So I went to the Perpich Center for Arts Education, which is um, an arts high school down in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and focused on theater there. And then I thought, I'll go out into the world and I'll be a theater major. And I picked a school that um, had a really serious theater program, discovered I didn't actually like serious theater, um, or it just, you know, it wasn't a fit, that particular program, but we had to take storytelling as a class second semester. And it was just, it was so fun and it felt so easy. And then all of a sudden I got to be all of the characters and, you know, essentially with words, create the lights and the staging and, um, and do all of it. So I, I ended up working for the Wonder Weavers who are storytellers based in the Twin Cities as well. Um, I went to school with uh, one of their daughters and it just sort of all worked out. I loved working with little kids. I started doing a lot of stuff with preschoolers. Um, I did princess birthday parties and pirate birthday parties and things like that. And then eventually, um, with all my connections to Scandinavian festivals, started doing started doing it that way. So now it's kind of a mix of, I mean, my, uh, I've had some pandemic career changes and I'm playing around with how all of that works. But um, yeah, I a couple years ago, I wrote a, wrote a kids play for the kids up here in Grand Marais that was a combination of five different Cinderella stories from different cultures. And so we had some narrators, but we had actors. So I just think stories are lovely. There's your, there's your long answer, but I am a storyteller, right? So that's maybe what you expect. You're such an amazing storyteller, Rose. And I had the privilege to see you in Madison before the pandemic and was looking for a way to integrate you in the Vesterheim programming. And so um, this was just a wonderful way for you to connect with people all over the country. 
Andrew and I are all already hatching ways we can bring you down to Vesterheim to do in-person storytelling so you can see all those smiling faces. Although I have to say, if your household was like my household, even though my camera was off, I was snorting and I was, you know, clucking and I hope that many of you were too. Yeah. So for the storyteller, it's nicer when you have that feedback from the audience, but you didn't miss a beat. So what a joy. joy. Thank you. Um, Do you have any other, any other questions? I have a really, really mini short story to end with at the very end, but if you have another question, I'm happy to answer any others. The only other question that I've seen come in that's that we want to make sure we ask is where was that last story from? Was that one that was your original? Linda was wondering how how you discovered that last story. Um, that no, these were all adaptations of folk tales, and I'm just looking if I have that book. I mean, it's on my shelf somewhere. Um, this that one actually, I believe, is in in the book that I got for my very first storytelling class, which is, I think, Best Loved Folk Tales from Around the World, um, edited and compiled by Joanna Cole. And I just, I had never heard it before. Um, and there's something about, <laughs> oh, hi, Janet. I'm seeing people, some familiar names popping up in the comments. Um, yeah, I just loved the idea of a goat pooping gold coins. Um, and for maybe some of you who uh, who have met my mom, because you maybe have Val Aerosmith, because um, she does a lot of stuff at Scandinavian festivals, I kind of love the idea of imagining bringing a goat home and showing my mom <laughs> and making her watch a goat poop. So, um, but I have also worked on, I have some stories that I've created what I call modern folk tales, where I'll maybe use different aspects of folk belief and myths like, um, all of the things that can happen on Midsummer's Eve, or some of, there aren't really many stories, um, Christmas stories about tomptas or nissas. There, there are just sort of little snippets, so I'll, I've created some of my own for that. Um, which if I can invite people to, to uh, an upcoming event, which I think will also be available as a Zoom event, the American Swedish Institute is hosting Yule Gladia, which I've done for many, many years with Ross Sutter. It's the Saturday and Sunday right after Thanksgiving. Um, so I'll be I'll be there as Tomta Kaisa um, doing stories for the kids and there'll be some music. And I believe there's also an online portion. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, if we would love to hear your one more mini story and then we have a short send off from Vesterheim, so. Take it away. Okay. <clears throat> Once upon a time, there was a girl who was walking down a country road. There was nothing really to be seen there. There was certainly nothing in her pockets and there was nothing in her belly. Some might have said there was nothing in her head. But others would have known that there were entire worlds. She, she was a girl who could see things that weren't there. But in this moment, she saw a thing that, that existed. It was the most beautiful box. It, it must have tumbled off of a wagon and it was simply laying there in the ditch with no one around. A beautiful wooden box with mother of pearl inlay and silver clasps and a little silver lock. Why, she could imagine so, so many treasures, such riches inside that box that she almost didn't want to try and open it, but, well, she did try. It was locked. And that didn't bother her at all. She would treasure that box and all of the things that might be inside. But she hadn't walked more than a hundred steps before something else caught her eye. Something glittering there in the dust and the dirt. It was a silver key. And the scroll work on that silver key matched perfectly the scroll work on the silver lock. I wonder, thought the girl who was prone to wondering, I wonder if this key will fit in this lock. And I'm sure you're all wondering as well. So pick up your box 
and your silver key and see what happens when you slide it in. It fit just so. Now I wonder, said the girl, I wonder what happens if I turn that key. And so she turned the key. But now I wonder, I wonder, she said, I wonder if the box will open. Should we try it? Now, I don't know what's in your box, but it wasn't gold or silver or jewels or any sort of riches, so to speak, in her box. It was a, a cow's tail. And if the cow's tail had been longer, this tail would be too. <laughs> Ta-da! Thanks so much for listening. Um, I know somebody was just asking about reading or hearing stories. I do have some on my website for a free download. It's rosearrowsmithdecoo.com. Um, I'll put it in the chat, but I think it's also on your website. Um, and then eventually you'll be able to watch these on the Vesterheim YouTube channel.